I'll get you a little bit into the Civil War by Wednesday because it's a quick road to secession from really the end of the Compromise of 1850. So the big thing to understand is that this didn't work. Uh, we're putting a little Band-Aid on a gushing wound at this point, and another one of Henry Clay's compromises, unfortunately, is not going to fix this you know, growing chasm between the North and the South. So looking at the 1850s in general, I'm hoping that you can draw a direct line to the Civil War from the end of the Mexican-American War. Just kind of think of what we acquire as a result of the Mexican-American War, and you, of course, have California, and the whole California issue blows the lid off slavery because you need to figure out if it's going to be free or slave. And when California gets to be a free state, the South freaks out. They get their fugitive slave law. That, of course, inspires Harriet Beecher Stowe to write her book, which only further polarizes the North and the South. So just kind of understand that that is the beginning of the end. And then we'll cover Kansas, Nebraska today. And that will solidify this divide by creating the Republican Party. So you'll see the impact of that by 1856 and, of course, in 1860. And remember how uh, the North is now passing these personal liberty laws. So they're doing that in direct defiance of the Fugitive Slave Act. The South, by the way, they're writing anti Tom novels to try to defend slavery and to try to still claim that it's, you know, a positive good and necessary for the economy. So again, we're just growing further and further apart and the presidents are playing like no role at all. They're weak, uh, indecisive and really letting uh, the country get further polarized. So just kind of keep in mind this overview. We'll get into a few specifics here, especially on Kansas, Nebraska. Oh, sorry, sorry. Click, 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 click. All right, here's Kansas, Nebraska. The designer of it is Stephen Douglas. So Stephen Douglas, um, maybe you remember this guy from eighth grade history. He's a little, hence the nickname, the little giant. But he is all about popular sovereignty. So if you can simply think, all right, Stephen Douglas, he wants to, I don't know, uh, take the pressure off of Congress and just allow the people to decide in Kansas and Nebraska whether they want to be free or slave. Just know that this is not going to work, but it's his plan. And Congress is going to go ahead with this because uh, it takes the pressure off them. So they're like, OK, let's open up Kansas, Nebraska to popular sovereignty. But what that does is negates the Missouri Compromise, which had technically kept the nation somewhat settled since 1820. So this thing is going to pass. It's going to open up Kansas and Nebraska to popular sovereignty. And when Kansas tries to figure it out, you got to understand that it's outright war. Um, they're fighting over slave or free. Um, a free government sets up, a slave government sets up, and both claim to be valid. So this does not work at all. In fact, the thing to write down is bleeding Kansas. Kansas is in civil war by 1854. The rest of the country goes into civil war by 1860, of course. So just understand that opening shots, they're really fired in the Kansas territory. Um, you also get kind of a radical guy that goes into Kansas and he just kills some alleged pro-slavery people. That's going to happen at Pottawatomie Creek. But you can see the blue and the red stars. These are attacks by pro-slavery, attacks by free state. These guys are in uh, you know, basically a civil war. They're burning down, uh, you know, capitals. They're they're attacking each other. Blood is definitely shed, especially when John Brown goes in and kills like these alleged pro-slavery guys. John Brown, you may not remember him from this incident, but I would say this is his opening shot. He uh, he feels like he's on a mission from God. He's got these apocalyptic visions of the end of the world and. He wants to rid the world of slavery. So he goes and kills these pro-slavery guys, but this is probably what you more so remember him for when he goes into Harper's Ferry. Uh, he tries to seize the federal arsenal and then arm all of the slaves. Tries to do this without telling any of the slaves that's his plan. But maybe you remember something about John Brown's kind of radicalism. So again, he's a New Englander, apocalyptic vision, the Harper's Ferry Raid is important to note. Um, and again, just 
think your way through this. He does all of this without telling anyone of his plan other than the guys that are with him. So maybe he wasn't all that with it. Either way, he's convicted of treason. He's executed uh, and then becomes kind of a, a different figure in the North or in the South. So just to understand the impact of John Brown, the South is going to view him as an outright madman. The South is dead set convinced that the North is now sending its crazies into the South to like start a civil war. So the South is going to get more defensive of their system. Whereas the North, well, hey, this is a guy willing to die for a cause. In fact, the North celebrates him. They write poems, songs about John Brown. In fact, this one, the, the lyrics here, John Brown's body lies moldered in the grave. You may have heard it. But they took uh, kind of an old tune. It was very popular during the Civil War. Um, anyway, viewed by totally different perspectives, depending on where you were. All right, back to the Kansas situation. This Lecompton Constitution is produced, and it's pro-slavery no matter what. And keep in mind that Kansas never really officially voted on it. Uh, both sides claim to be the valid government in California, or I'm sorry, in Kansas. Um, but no matter the outcome, um, LeCompton says, oh, yeah, no matter what you guys vote on, Kansas is going to have slavery. So how is that popular sovereignty if nobody officially has no consensus on the vote? It's messed up. And as a result, Stephen Douglas, the guy that creates that Kansas-Nebraska Act, he says, hey, this doesn't reflect popular sovereignty. I don't like it. So if Stephen Douglas is fighting against a pro-slavery thing, you've got to understand the impact and back up for a second. What political party is Stephen Douglas? He's a Democrat. Well, with a Democrat now fighting against this pro-slavery thing, you've got to understand he just split the Democratic Party in two. So now you're going to have Douglas leading the Northern Democrats, and you're going to have some Southern Democrats who are going on the pro-slavery bandwagon. But anytime your party splits, that's probably not good news for winning future elections. So here's the Lecompton Constitution forcing slavery down the throat of a free soiler. And again, no matter what, like no matter what the vote, which they never even really did, Lecompton guarantees that Kansas will have slavery. So messed up, upsets the North. In fact, one guy in the North, um, calls it the crime against Kansas, and he makes a big speech. Well, look what happens when Charles Sumner makes his speech on the floor of Congress. A pro-slavery guy from South Carolina nearly caned him to death. Can you say that passions are getting inflamed, that we're getting more and more polarized? Violence again in Congress, yeah, it's getting pretty messed up, simply you know, foreshadowing the violence that is about to be there. So Bully Brooks is from South Carolina, Charles Sumner, maybe just, uh, you know, underline or put a, a note on Charles Sumner's name, because he's going to come back later. He almost dies. He has to go to Europe to get like some special treatment. And when he comes back, it's the tail end of the Civil War. Well, he'll be the leader in Congress when uh, Congress takes over like the Reconstruction phase. And guess what? His goal is to punish the South. Hmm. Think he's seeking any vengeance against the violence directed towards him. So more on Charles Sumner later, but maybe just remember this. Okay, as for the birth of the Republicans, they've got a coalition of a bunch of different groups that were kind of, you know, splintered off over the last 20 years with that weird Whig party. Um, so, sorry, the Northern Whigs, you remember they're, they're starting to, to break off once some of the Southern Whigs liked uh, all the pro-slavery elements. Many of the Northern Democrats don't like the pro-slavery uh, options, so they're going to kind of form this coalition. The old Free Soilers, the old abolitionists, and the Know-Nothings will actually join up with the Republican Party. So they've got a pretty solid coalition. And this is somewhat miraculous. Two years in to a brand new political party, they almost won a presidential election. So you've got the winner, James Buchanan, the Democrat, John Fremont, a hero of the Mexican-American War, and Millard Fillmore. He's basically a know-nothing candidate here. Um, three guys running. Fremont, uh, got a cool slogan, free soil, free men, Fremont. 
And the South was already saying, if this guy wins, they're going to secede. So a bunch of moderates, a bunch from the border states, they either went with the American party or they went with the Democrat to keep the nation together. And you can basically see how it breaks down. Fremont, brand new party, gets 114 electoral votes. Um, but Buchanan wins with 45.3%. And again, it's these border states that basically didn't want to, you know, be torn apart with a civil war. And Millard Fillmore, third party, actually won electoral votes. Kind of notable there, 26%. And again, the American party, that was the know-nothing party. They wanted to, you know, be against the immigrants. Okay, one quick court case to note. Uh, no more John Marshall, by the way, which might make you happy. Now you have a pro-Southerner, Roger Tawney. And this guy... Um, has to decide the fate of Dred Scott, whose owner moved north. And now that he's living in the north, he sues for his freedom because in the north there wasn't slavery. So eventually this court case is kicked up to the Supreme Court. And the simplest thing for you to understand is the court goes crazy with its ruling. Rather than simply like decide the fate of Dred Scott, uh, the Supreme Court goes like super pro-slavery and says that Congress can't even legislate slavery because slaves are property and property is protected. So the Supreme Court says, no, 1820, 1850, all those compromises are unconstitutional. And by the way, black people can never become citizens. Therefore, they can't sue in courts and they can not be citizens. Don't stress every detail here. But again, I would understand that the ruling is super pro-Southern, pro-slavery, and it's going to further you know, tear apart the nation. So the South gets this very pro-slavery ruling. All right, now Lincoln's coming along. So kind of the rise of Abe Lincoln, do you remember at all when I first mentioned him? Hopefully you recall Spotty Lincoln, uh, how he was against the origins of the Mexican-American War, wanting to know the exact spot it started. Well, after that, he faded away and went back to law. Uh, he did not have a huge record like in politics. So just know that it's Kansas, Nebraska that brings him out of the shadows. And now he's like a leading voice uh, in the new Republican Party. And he's a very, very powerful speaker. And that in part explains why he's able to rise so fast. So he's against um, you know, the, the whole Kansas, Nebraska situation. He's against Dred Scott. And he's chosen to run against Mr. Popular Sovereignty, Stephen Douglas. Both of them are from Illinois. So maybe you're familiar with this. Um, and again, little political experience we mentioned. Maybe you've heard of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I actually had to read the entire transcripts, like 400 pages of this, in my freshman year uh, history class at Michigan State. So both express their viewpoints on slavery, on popular sovereignty, and they tour around the state of Illinois debating all of this stuff. Um, a house divided against itself cannot stand were the words of Lincoln uh, in one of the debates. So here's the interesting thing. You're in a senatorial election. Lincoln actually lost this, but his claim to fame is that, whoa, he's eloquent, and he gave this Stephen Douglas guy a run for his money. So do understand that Lincoln becomes a nationwide figure as a result of this. So even though he doesn't win, he'll be chosen to run for the Republicans in 1860. And wow, you've got a mess of a situation because everyone's breaking up. So you've got the Democrats who have now officially split into the Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, and you get another kind of middle of the road party. Just give yourself a quick note that anytime your party splits, uh, it's not going to be good for your political future. So just think of half the Democratic vote's going to go this way, the other half that way. That means Lincoln's going to be able to kind of skate by with a minority of votes. And do understand that the Republican Party is going to build a coalition by not being all that radical. They're not going to be outright abolitionists. They simply want to say, OK, let's not allow the extension of slavery into the territories. Like, Let's have a protective tariff. Those are the old Whigs, the, the old Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, Northerners. Um, and the Republican Party will, will really cater to big business from this point forward, even up to modern day. No abridgment of rights for immigrants. They want the immigrant vote. Um, 
They want to build a Pacific Railroad. They want to get the Western vote, and they actually will. So just think, they've got a little bit for everyone here. Internal improvements at federal expense. Let's get the Western vote that way by paying for it. And even we'll give farmers uh, some free land. So this is how you build a coalition. You've got all of these planks in your platform, a little bit for everyone. And if that's enough, then you can possibly win a presidential election. So just know that the Republican Party, uh, the common misconception is that they're all about the abolition of slavery. That is not the case. In fact, Lincoln outright says he won't even abolish slavery. He just doesn't want to expand it into the territories. So maybe you got to hit pause on the recording, get a few of these things down. I do see it as a question. All the following are parts of the Republican Party platform, except. So make note of it. Think about it. There's the Southern nominee. Nice mustache. I'm not going to sweat the names too much. Um, there's Stephen Douglas. Again, I'm not going to sweat this too much, but let's look at. Uh, kind of this last ditch effort at compromise. So clearly we are getting torn apart. There you see it. Lincoln is going to win the North and the West. You've got the Southern Democrat, you've got Stephen Douglas, and you've got the Constitutional Union Party. But check this out. Lincoln won with 39.8% of the popular vote. That was enough of the electoral vote to win it. So he's able to win this thing. And as soon as he does win, the South secedes. So let's note that South Carolina is the first to secede. Yes, you got to know South Carolina is the first to secede and the rest of the Deep South does as well. Now, why do they secede? Well, South Carolina actually wrote their reasons for secession and they said, well, it's because of slavery and slavery will be threatened. And they came up with like a multi-point platform where it's all about slavery being the primary reason for their secession. So if somebody asks you, if I ask you, what's the primary cause of the Civil War? It's slavery. Without a doubt, it's slavery. And if someone's trying to sneak in, well, it's states' rights. States' rights to do what? You'll see in the South Carolina reasoning, you'll see what the vice president of the Confederacy will say, it's all about slavery. So I can't be more clear on that point. All right. Um, this, by the way, is the declaration. Don't write it down, but this is like the declaration of the immediate causes which induce and justify the secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union. They're mad at the North for not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. Slavery. Believe Constitution protected slavery. Angry at the government for its role in abolishing. Yet another thing about slavery. They're mad at Lincoln because they think that Lincoln's an abolitionist, even though he said he wasn't. And the primary reason, increasing hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery. Four other states also issue reasons where slavery is the primary cause. So you don't need to write that down. But again, just note the primary reason for the Civil War, the primary reason for secession is slavery. Okay. So now you have the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America are born. There's your president, Jefferson Davis. There's your vice president, Alexander Stevens. And look what Alexander Stevens says. Uh, he declared that the, new, that, that the cornerstone of the new government rested upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. So there you have the Confederacy founded on the back of slavery, president, vice president. Yes, I would note those names. And last thing that I need to mention, this guy tries to come up with a compromise to save the Union. This John Henry Cretendon guy, an old know-nothing, tries to bring back the 3630 line. It doesn't work. Um, basically, we're going to have civil war once Lincoln takes over. But maybe the key... The South seceded when Buchanan was still president. Uh, what did Buchanan do about this? Nothing. So understand like the lame duck period. Lincoln had won the election, but the president is still in power until actually March. Um, so just kind of understand that in the lame duck period, you're still president, but Buchanan was like, ah, not my problem. So he just kind of let the nation get torn apart even further.
So this was an attempt. It doesn't work. Lincoln is going to inherit an outright mess when he takes over in 1861. There we have it for the day. I know a lot of information. Let me know if you have questions. Tomorrow we'll get into some of the details about like northern and southern advantages, disadvantages. And again, keep in mind it's a busy week, so you may want to pace yourself. Have a good day.